Hello, hello. Welcome to the Japan Zumina at UC San Diego. It's July 6th in San Diego and July 7th in Japan. Ohayou gozaimasu. Ohayou gozaimasu. I'm Ulrike Shader. I'm a professor of Japanese business at UC San Diego and the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. JFIT is at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We have a number of different programs in international relations and public policy, uh, including a master's of international affairs with a Japan specialization. If that's of interest, visit our website. It's at gps.ucsd.edu. And JFIT is our Japan center. We try to connect Southern California with Japan. If you'd like to know more about that, go to jfit.ucsd.edu. If you go there, you can find a number of tabs. One is the news and media tab where you can sign up for our San Diego Japan news flash, the un news or the unexpected news from Japan. It's a bi-weekly uh, brief and we, we try to keep it interesting. Right next to that tab is the Japan Zuminas tab where you can uh, visit our uh, past events and sign up for our upcoming ones. There's also a support button and it would be just absolutely lovely if you gave it a little bit of a look uh, and find these give now buttons and uh, consider whether you might be interested in uh, sharing just a little bit of support with us. Uh, if you had to come to our campus, you would have to park your car and you would have to uh, drive and uh, be in the traffic jam. And if you count that all in, uh, if you could share some of that with us, that would be great. It would keep us going. Um, our Zoominar is a weekly event. Uh, it's on Tuesdays, uh, 4.30 p.m. San Diego time. We have, uh, of course, today, uh, Ken Shibusawa with us, who I'll introduce momentarily. Next week, we'll have Asby Brown, and we'll talk about architecture and design for a better environment and what we can learn from Japan. Uh, and then we'll have Dave Lahaney, who will, on the eve of the Olympics, will talk about thwarted commemorations. Um, the Olympics and beyond. As I mentioned, our Zoominars are recorded. And in order to protect your privacy, when you later on type in questions into our Q&A box, I will refer to you only by your first name um, so that you can, uh, you don't have to worry about uh, that. Um, and you can uh, look at past reporting, recordings on our website. This is my uh, own website, and the only reason I'm bringing this up here is that uh, I will soon have to probably revise that image because <laughs> Shibusawa Eiichi is going to be on the new Shotoku. The Shotoku is the 10,000 yen note. We used to call it Shotoku because <laughs> Shotoku Taiji was on it, and, and now, of course, it's uh, Fukusawa Eiichi. And uh, I believe beginning next year, it will be Shibusawa uh, 20, 2024. 2024, thank you. All right, so, uh, so uh, you know, Shibusawa Eiji uh, was a, um, let me stop this and, uh, and, and, and Ken's here with us. So Ken is a great, great grandson of, uh, of uh, Shibusawa Eiji. So welcome, Ken Shibusawa. Thank you, really. And um, let me just say a few things about your great, great grandfather. He lived from 1840 to 1931. He founded more than 500 companies making, uh, you know, great use of the, Meiji restoration and the opportunities and possibilities that it created. And, um, you know, among the companies that he founded was Daiichi Bank, which is now Mizuho, Oji Paper, Tokyo Fire and Marine, Tokyo Gas, Sapporo Breweries, thank you for that, the Teikoku Hotel, and my alma mater, Dotsubashi mm -hmm. University. Uh, the name came from the, 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 I want to say Daimyo, I'm not even sure that he signed up with before the Meiji Restoration, Hitotsubashi Yoshinobu. And so he, grant, he founded this, uh, this, this university in 1875, captain of industry, I got the t-shirt too. It's my alma mater. I went uh, there as a PhD student and taught there as, a, as an assistant professor. So, uh, so I'm very grateful personally to Shigusawa Eiji for paving the way for Japanese capitalism and the system of Japanese capitalism. And so I'm all the more excited to have Ken here with me. Uh, hello, Ken, Hi. thank you for joining us. So Ken Shibusawa 
is, uh, is in Tokyo, uh, joining us from Tokyo. He, um, he grew up, uh, I think, at least part-time in the United States. He has an undergraduate degree from the, from the University of Texas and an MBA from UCLA, 1987 or something like that. So it's a Baburu Gannen, first year mm -hmm. of the bubble. And, um, and, and also attended summer school at UC San Diego in the 80s. Twice. 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 Good choice. Yep. Um, graduating from, in 1987 with an MBA meant you had an open door into Wall Street and you went to the dark <laughs> yeah. side of finance. Uh, you joined JP Morgan, <laughs> Goldman Sachs, more capital, uh, hedge fund, really dark. Um, and then we turned to Japan and um, became the, uh, you know, you founded a, a, a an in, in, in individual investment advisory company called uh, Shibusawa and Co, as well as um, the Commons Asset Management Company that uh, you are also currently still chairman of, which is a asset management company that puts particular emphasis on ESG and SDG investments, so environment, um, uh, sustainability, governance um, affairs. You are director of KSI Doyukai and also a director of the AG Shibusaba Foundation. You're very busy right now because NHK is running a, a story on your great your grandfather. So, so thank you for joining us, Ken. It's great to have you. Thank you, really. Very nice to be here. I wish I was, I was in San Diego, actually, <laughs> rather than talking yeah, here. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so let's start. Um, you have a, um, a particular view. Uh, believe it or not, it's a new era. And no. so let's let's hear from you what you mean by that. And okay. um, and then we'll uh, uh, we'll go into the discussion. Okay. Um, now, sh you mentioned my great great grandfather Shibusawa Aichi, and um, he did a lot of things uh, back in the era when Japan was entering into an era from from a feudal state um, to a modern, you know, uh, economic uh, state. <clears throat> um, of course, the the new era right now is not going to be as dramatic <clears throat> as the new. You know, as the as the major restoration, um, but 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 I think you know we're we're in a new era right now. Um, when we think about the future, uh, people are simple; uh, they want simple answers. And so, usually, when we th think about the future, we think about it in a straight line. And so, um, like you mentioned, when I was uh, you know in the '80s, <clears throat> you know coming back to Japan in the '80s, working for investment banks here in Japan. Um, Everybody thought <clears throat> that the future was going, was going to keep on skyrocketing, right? And what we saw was the the grounds of the imperial palace uh, being the same, you know, value <clears throat> as this whole state of California or something like that, right? Pretty ridiculous, right? Um, and that didn't happen, right? And currently, uh, Japan is an aging society, um, less children. Um, Japan will continue to sink into the future, and. I think the future never arrives in a straight line, and for me, the 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 um, the uh, the hint it right is, uh, is here. It says history doesn't repeat itself, um, but it does rhyme. Uh, this is a you know famous quote from the famous author Mark Twain, um, and when it means rhyme, I kind of interpret this as a kind of a rhythm. <clears throat> Um, so if you can see a rhythm in the past, um, that rhythm might be continuing to the future. And so a rhythm basically means it's it's like the uh, it's like a, a cyclical nature. Um, and if you think about it, well, 1990, this was the peak of the bubble. Um, and I was born in 1961. And so after I was born, Japan experienced 30 years of prosperity. Um, you know, we were called Japan as number one. Um, I'm, I'm sure you remember that era uh, if you're around my age. Um, and then, but the 30 years prior to that, if you think about it, that was the period of war. Um, what is war? It, it, it's the um, period of destruction where old norm was, uh, was reset <clears throat> and a new norm was born. And so, you know, it was, a, it was an era of lots of, uh, you know, destruction, lots of misery, uh, sadness, um, it should never be repeated. Um, but because of that great reset, possibly the next <clears throat> 30 years, was able to prosper. Go back another 30 years. Um, and at the beginning of this 30 years, around 1904, 1905, there was the uh, Russo-Japanese War. And this war basically said uh, an emerging state, Japan, caught up with the West. <clears throat> 
Um, and this is probably a period where in that uh, history of Japan up until this period, um, you know, the ordinary citizens probably lived the most prosperous life they ever had in, in the past history. So it was an era of prosperity. Then you go back another 30 years, and this was the Meiji Restoration, where prior there was almost 270 years of the norm of the Meiji period. And during the Meiji Restoration, it, it was destructed. <clears throat> um, and from that emerged the new uh, modern day uh, state of Japan. So it's a very simplistic, um, not very academically rigorous uh, <laughs> look into the past. But, but if you think about it, well, after the major restoration, Japan had 30 years of uh, destruction. And because of that next 30 years, there was prosperity. And prosperity is good, but when it lasts, you know, people are kind of weak. They get kind of overconfident. There's a lot of hubris. Um, and so maybe that's why the next 30 years was destructed, right? Then we said another <clears throat> uh, 30 years of prosperity in the 80s, especially the late 80s, lots of overconfidence, lots of hubris here in Japan. And so um, when we passed through 1990, uh, we were told that we're in a lost decade. And people said, well, no, it's two decades and maybe, maybe even three decades, right? Um, but I think if this rhythm is still going on, basically we're not in the period of lost decade, but it was the, uh, the, the decades of destruct, destruction. And if this same rhythm, the same tune is going, um, well, guess what? 2020 is supposed to be the new year. <clears throat> and I've been thinking about this uh, rhythm, the cyclical nature from about 10 years ago when I established uh, Commons Asset Management, which is a mutual fund for individual households, um, cross-generational, stuff and and i was looking at this and i thought wow 2020 is going to be a really interesting year i thought it was going to be like a tipping point for japan and and then i would start thinking about it and that's when i came up with this sort of rhythm <clears throat> for the for the past um but at the end of 2019 um i thought well i've been using this slide for about 10 years but maybe it's about time to shelf it you know because because uh there's lots of changes in society that I can feel in my, you know, my daily life through my work, but there was just never, never this point of this destruction. And then 2020 came around and guess what? <clears throat> well, um, in the past destruction, there was this world war, um, but even in a world war, I think the world didn't stop at the same time. <clears throat> it, it, it happened this time. <clears throat> so I think there's this, you know, this, really impactful destruction that came um, that really kind of woke us, woke us up from the, from the old norms. Um, so I figure, well, maybe I could use this slide a little bit longer <laughs> to see how, how, it, how it unfolds. Um, the reason why um, I thought 2020 was interesting is because I was looking at the Japanese demographics. This is 1930. <clears throat> um, so Showa started and it's about, you know, I guess it's in about in its fourth, fifth year or something like that. Um, my uh, father was born a year, year prior. He's turning 92 this year. Um, and if you think about it, it was from this, this pyramid basically through the Showa period and then 1950s, a lot of kids show up and this is the uh, baby boomers in Japanese Dankai no Sedai. And it was basically this um, pyramid that really drove the Showa period. 1961 is the year I was born, but that was the year that we had national uh, health coverage system, uh, national pension system. And so basically by 1960, um, you know, Japan as we know it, <clears throat> what was basically in place. Um, and this, and basically this population pyramid drove the growth um, through the 80s, right? Then you go through the 1990s, we're in a new era. It's called the Heisei period, Showa's over. And, and to me, Heisei is a transition period because basically it, it kind of went from this sort of pyramid to this double shaped, um, double barrel shaped uh, demographic. And basically for the last 30 years, it's shifted upwards like this, right? And then, then we entered 2019, Lewa started. So 2020, we're in the new era. Um, and, and look what happens. 
well, that's a new normal, <laughs> right? Uh, um, so, um, so people look at this thing and like, wow, there's no way, no way that Japan can be prosperous <clears throat> um, in, in the future. And, you know, and this is our foreseen future because it's, it's the population demographics and demographics don't change dramatically. So this, this is gonna happen. Um, and, and my question is if we stay on the same um, mode of thinking as in the Showa period, all the things that we established in the Showa period, all the success models um, and just kind of extrapolate into the future in a straight line, yeah, there's no way Japan will be prosperous um, in, in this era. But if you look at it <clears throat> currently, 2020, 2021, there's the foreseen future. The future is going to happen for sure. Um, and there's also the unforeseen future, uh, which means it can get a lot worse or it can get better. <clears throat> that, that's the unforeseen future. It's called in, in finance industry, we call it risk. Risk doesn't mean it's dangerous. It means there's uncertainty, right? And uncertain, with uncertainty, um, there's possible uh, rewards in that, which we call in, in the finance industry, uh, return. And, and in that <clears throat> unforeseen future, the, the main actors that I'm really counting on is actually this 30s, 20s, 10s, <clears throat> what we call the millennials and the, and the, and the Generation Z. Um, you look at this and you go like, well, when the people in their 30s, they're 30s now, but by 2050, they'll, they'll be 60. People in their 20s will be in their 50s and people in their 10s will be in their 40s. And so obviously <clears throat> they're in the, you know, the middle of, of the working uh, force creating value uh, in, in the society. So that, that's for sure, right? Um, but the problem is we have so little of them. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. But if you think about it, uh, the millennials and the, uh, the Generation Z, um, they're what we call digital natives. Um, you know, when they were born, when they, you know, I don't think they, they never seen a world that was not connected by the internet. It was always connected. It's a given. So what's an internet? Well, there are some countries that restricts <clears throat> the use of internet, but basically internet, basically it, it's just, it just, it crosses over borders very, very easily. Um, and the technology is such that, you know, there's, you know, automated translation services, which, you know, at first it kind of was really kind of the translations were kind of iffy, um, but, you know, they get better and better, you know, <clears throat> as the years go on. So my question is, what, what if, what if <clears throat> the people, young people in Japan in their 30s, 10s and 10s says, you know, this generation says, well, yeah, I, I, I live in Japan. I work in Japan, but I'm a digital native. I'm connected <clears throat> to the world. Well, what do you see then? Well, then you see that the world is actually very, very young. I mean, this, this, this zone, there's lots of lots of people. And many of them actually are, in, of course, in the emerging markets. Um, so, but, you know, what, what do the lot of the, um, the many, many people in the emerging countries in the same age bracket, what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for a job uh, for pay and to support their family <clears throat> with that pay, right? And so, uh, so it, it's just a normal economic growth that Japan experienced in the past, uh, I guess what we call the population bonus. And so that growth is still there, but there are lots of social issues, lots of environmental issues and things like that. So to me, here in Japan, we have you know, not just large corporations that we all know about, but there's SMEs, there are startups, uh, and there are lots of, I think, um, combinations and, 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 and things that these companies can do to actually support the well-being of lots of people around the world. <clears throat> At least there's that potential. And, and if that potential is realized, then kind of like, well, there's lots and lots of people around the world says, hey, I like Japan being around because it supports my well-being of my li livelihood. Well, if that model is, it's just a, you know, a question right now but if it's realized well well if you know if japan and japanese corporations japanese people are you know so, sought after <clears throat> by so many people in the world well i figure you know we, be, we should be able to find some model of prosperity uh, during that during that era so my uh hope for the future is <clears throat> well in the past um, we had this model called Made in Japan. We were super successful, right? Um, 
basically uh, answering the mass consumption needs of mostly the uh, developed, you know, uh, advanced economies of the world. Um, and we did such a good job at it with mass production that, you know, the United States and other countries kind of got angry with us and they started this sort of what we call bashing here, right? So that was the Showa period. This was the success model. Then we went into the Heisei period and Japan changed the model a little bit, right? Said, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll make it in your country made by Japan. And it was a rational uh, change, uh, model change. Um, but the Heisei period started with Japan bashing and, and by the end of the Heisei period, it was Japan passing. So to me, <clears throat> the reason why I think Heisei was a transition period is because it went from bashing to passing basically, right? So I'm hoping for the new era for Leiwa <clears throat> is not a model just made in Japan, uh, a model not just made by Japan, uh, but a model of made with Japan. <clears throat> um, let's let's work with the world to have a prosperous, 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 pros, prosperous, 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 uh, well-being, uh, you know, a livelihood, you know, with with Japan. And 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 if that's possible, if that's possible, well, I, I think um, that it would be a new era. So. I have a podcast called Made with Japan, <laughs> actually. Um, I can't do it weekly, like Uruk, but um, Uruk, Uruk. That's right. I'm chopping up Uruk. your name. I'm, I'm <laughs> chopping up your name. That's, that's, but, that's just fine. <laughs> but, but I have this uh, podcast, so, so if you're interested, check it out. And I've got some interesting guests on, including a millennial last time. So that, that, that was fun. So um, that's it for my end. I'm sure there's a bunch of, bunch of questions. So why don't we just take it from there? Yes, and um, uh, I, I have a, a bunch of questions, and I'll invite the audience to type your questions into the Q and A, and I will try to weave your comments into our conversation. So uh, the, the the first question that you know is kind of pretty obvious as I'm looking at you talking. To, so you, you you talk about the the young guys, and they they've had the iPad or whatever attached to their hands as they you know <laughs> at age two, but, but you mean. Know, the alternative to this population pyramid or a way that could assuage it is, of course, immigration. So rather than going abroad or doing that, you know, kind of making the world global, you could also say, well, people come to Japan and, um, and, and, and work here. But that's not real. That wasn't part of your story here. So, so how would that play in? I mean, do you see a future where um where japan just basically tries to to rather than using the technology to make up for the you know for the shrinkage um would, would immigration be be an option or is that how, how, how does that fit in uh it definitely fits in that, that's why it's made with japan right <clears throat> not just i didn't say made just by japanese but made with yeah. japan so so obviously that's part of the equation and you know and Compared to a lot of the other countries in the world, or especially the advanced economies, Japan seems like a very, very closed country in terms of immigration. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting is if you look at my uh, entering class in elementary school in, what was that, 1970 something, right? 70 something, or no, 1960s. Um, there's this, you know, it was this black and white picture of me, lots of children and the mothers, right? <laughs> and, and, and my kids about 20 years ago, or about 10 something years ago, went to this exact same school, a uh, public school here was in color. Um, it was uh, not just the mothers, but the dads as well in the picture. And it was so international. I mean, it's like, there's lots of lots of different race. And this is a public school, right? Public Japanese school. <clears throat> and so, you know, and, and 30 years ago during the Showa, you would never hear any um, politician or anybody in public saying, oh, we need immigration here in Japan. But if, even from the Heisei period. But, but now currently, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a taboo, you know, because, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of people in the, especially in the rural areas, <laughs> they don't have enough people. And so they can't say, you know, uh, you know we, we don't need foreigners here. They need it, 
but but they don't really call it immigration they call it trainees and they call it other things like that and so and, and there are um lots of problems that should be solved that, I, that we could dig in further if you want but um to me it is definitely part of the uh, the the uh, the uh the solution and, and it's happening because it, it's it's normal you know it's it's you know if you walk into a japanese corporation if you see you know a, a blonde hair woman working there it's like oh right <laughs> so it was kind of a big deal um now it's like oh when you know, i think like, that's right so yeah and and i agree with you by the way if you look at the statistics um you know of course there's the old uh, saying that if you start from zero, everything is a hundred percent increase. But, but yeah. the 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 increase in immigration to Japan has been quite amazing, mm. uh, and and you know this it, it is changing. So this this idea that Japan is, is super restrictive on immigration, I think, is no longer true. I mean, we need to revise that. So so what's the you, you have the the um, this this uh, heisei is is a transition, uh, and we we have a question on that. But before I go to the heisei, what's the difference between shōwa and reiwa? So you have this very positive view for reiwa, and shōwa was a good well, the second half of shōwa was a pretty good time. It was rapid growth and the the the, the formation of a Japanese economy. Um, developmental state, all of that, right? And so what's the difference between Shoba and Reva? Are we going to see a repeat or is there other big differences? Yeah, well, first it is, um, it's it's good, bad. I mean, there was Shoba, there was a lot of good things, lots of bad things. In Dewa, there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of bad things, um, but there might be good things. So, so, so in, in any era, I think there's good and the bad. Um, but if you compare <clears throat> Showa and Dewa and just say Heisei was a transition period, um, what's striking is one is I showed you is the population demographics. That's that's pretty obvious. Uh, the second second is um, technology. I, I kind of mentioned as well, I internet and that kind of stuff, uh, access to information, which um, think about the sort of uh, foundations of democracy, what, what do you need? Well, if you look at those two things, um, I think in democracy, um, I'm not a historian on this, but but if you look at France or the United States, when the democracy took place, I think basically what democracy was is lots of young people wanting a change from the status quo. <clears throat> that, that, that's how democracy basically thrived. Um, now you have, especially here in Japan, and, and I guess increasingly probably in the United States or, or well, well, definitely in Europe, is you're going to have an older population who wants the status quo, not not so much to change, and so that that really changed the dynamics in, in, in the um, the uh, democracy from a demographic standpoint. The other thing about democracy is it's it's made on the assumption that everybody has access to equal information. And based on information, you have different values, and you make your you make your judgment. And so, yeah. So compared to the past, there's much more information out there with technology. Um, but you know, I mean, there's fake news and all kinds of stuff, and and so you need you need to be more information savvy because there's so much information out there in a sense. And so in in the show up period, you look at the newspapers, you saw the television on NHK, and says, oh, that was the fact. Well, it's not really <clears throat> these days. So that's another big difference. And the third difference is I was thinking about is probably mobility because in the Showa period, uh, a lot of people came from the countryside to get jobs in the cities. <clears throat> that was a big that was a big population mobility back then. Um, these days, well, the um, actually, um, if you the, Japan's a populate a decreasing population, but if you look at the population of Tokyo, it's not going to decrease <laughs> the next thirty years, and so that's still true. Um, but um, another thing is though, like, but if you joined a company in Japan, let's say 30 years ago, the, the social contract, the assumption was that you're there for lifetime employment, whatever that, whatever lifetime, <clears throat> it's not, wasn't really lifetime, but, but that was the assumption, right? You don't, you don't go changing jobs once you come join company A to company B, but now, well, that's not, that's not, there's no, the social stigma about that is not, is not as high. Um, and if you look at the younger generation, and especially the achievers, 
people in the achievers, they're kind of like, well, yeah, I could, I joined this company, but you know, I think I have better opportunities somewhere else. <clears throat> and so they, and they're more mobile. And, and if the companies don't realize, they do realize it, but they don't know how to handle it is the fact that, that the younger talent, the talented people are much more mobile. And if they just kind of stick to the show model of, oh, you have to wait 30 years to become, you know, <laughs> to, to have impact in the country, company. Well, I mean, yeah, there are people that are going to hang around for that, <clears throat> obviously, but but the achievers can say, well, may, uh, thank you so much, but maybe I'll find somewhere else. And so, so I, was got, I got a little bit long winded, but it's the, the dem demograph dem demograph dem demographics, the technology and, and uh, the mobility, I think is, is the big three. So, so Jenny makes an important point about the demography. We, we, we can just let it rest, but it's a footnote, which mm -hmm. I think is an important one. That is, are we exaggerating the impact of demography in the sense that we all are going to live longer, you know, there, there are improvements in health, we can increase the working age. Uh, and then, of course, so there's an extra source of productivity input as people are, you know, the 70 year old today is very different from the 70 year old in the 1960s, obviously, right, because yeah. it's like it's the new yeah. 60 or something. Yeah. So, um, so we, the, it's actually not even effect. clear that it is it is exactly yeah. the same as you're showing right because the older guys uh, are going to be are still yeah. productive for long and time. actually yeah it's true because that's the population demographic of the country but if you look at the corporations it's, it looks totally different actually the biggest part the, the big, biggest bulge is not is not the baby juniors it's the bubble <clears throat> bubble guys <laughs> And they're, you know, the, the, the baby juniors are in their 40s, but the bubble guys are in their 50s, right? And actually, this, this actually is, is the key um, for why corporations are, I think, not, has not, have not changed as much. Because if you think about it, well, they've put their, you know, 30 years of their investment, their lives in this company, and they got, probably got one more post. <clears throat> they're not going to mess around with, with new challenges, you know taking risks, right? You just want the status quo. Um, but guess what? In 10 years, most of them will be out of the work, not, not out of the workforce, but they'll be out of the co company. And so a company that realizes this sort of big demographic shift happening inside their corporations um, and willing to empower their younger talent um, and then other companies as well, no, you gotta, you know, <clears throat> you gotta drain the ditches and wash the sink <clears throat> for the next, 10 years before it becomes, before, you know, you, you can come join the work, you know, the, uh, the product productivity of the workforce. Um, you know, yeah, that's, that's, clearly that has to go away. I mean, this, 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 this idea of the stable or the, the army training of two years of boot camp and, you know, sort of the sumo do the same thing, right? So the young sumos have to be the kabanmochi for a long time. And I think that the kabanmochi is going to go away because there's just, you know, it's about the talent and promoting the talent. Christina has another question that uh, on your made, made with Japan um, uh, concept. And that is that the word make, uh, to, she's a trade uh, a political scientist, right? And, 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 and her question is, uh, does it sort of focus on manufacturing there and tradable items and, and made with Japan when mate is the, the, the. so what's your view on oh. Japan as a player, what she says leader in software IT all of this, all of this new next gen. Yeah, I mean, I think made I, I don't. I don't really think of it. Well, made in Japan was obviously yeah that that, that was manufacturing, but but um, but I made the fonts different, right? <laughs> if you notice that, <laughs> so made I think in this context is more about creativity, you know, you know. So so in the creativity, it can go from you mentioned you know IT and that kind of stuff. It can go to the arts. It can go to cuisine. <clears throat> you know, many 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 different areas. And so to me, made is more about the creativity. Uh, uh, turning on the creativity switch for made made with Japan is my, my point there. Um, and there are some areas that Japan is not competitive with, which software programming is, well, not really. I mean, not really. Well, it, it depends on the software. Uh, I guess so. You know, so, there are, there's no yeah. other, there are no other engineers that can make trains run on time. Like, like oh, yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. But, 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 the, but, 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 but,
yeah that, the, that's because there's the hardware moving and then you want to move it more efficiently yeah, that's true but i think it's more of a mentality thing is like i mean you have to, you have to this is the actually goes back to the manufacturing thing i think because um japanese mentality is that you have to have a product that's perfect before you you know with no flaws before you bring it to market it's sort of the mentality i think right and so you can't put a beta beta car out there like tesla did basically <clears throat> right um, but but a software company says well we'll put a beta beta you know out, out there and then then it says oh there's a bug here oh there's a bug there okay we'll fix it and and that's the way that's the way software develop but in japan it's more like you have to have it you know the perfect <clears throat> before you bring it out there so well, Conrad makes a, a point that I was actually just going to make. So, um, uh, so in my recent book, The Business Reinvention of Japan, I argue that we can already trace the made with Japan as Japan is a provider of input components, um, parts, advanced materials, uh, even factory automation equipment, they have Funnock and its robots and so forth and so on. So, so the Make with Japan is already happening. We can already put a put a number on it. And Conrad made that same point because the because of pre products. I, I, I would I, so 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 I think it's already there, right? Um, the, the the question is whether Japan can sort of uh, you know make 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 uh, continue to make money out of this, which actually depends on what China is going to do. We have two questions on China. And I want to take us there because clearly that's the 800 pound, <laughs> pound gorilla in Asia. So, uh, so the first question on China is whether your 30 year framework would also have predictive power for what's going to happen in China next. Would you maybe see a similar trend? And, uh, and Hiroki uh, wants to add to that. Um, with whether this new era for Japan corresponds with change in China, right? So, so far this China's rise, maybe it's a sort of a, um, you know, kind of alternation there, or it uh, depends on what will happen in China for the next three decades, he thinks, but, but what happens in Japan and what happens in China are related. So what do you, what do you say to that? Yeah, um, yeah, um, definitely, because in this, the, the, the demographics definitely a sense that J China will be following Japan pretty quickly <laughs> in terms of the aging population. That's good. But the, the question in the, in the in the is is, well, can the country um, give freedom and empower the younger generation to do what they want? And in a sense, within the realm of their control, I mean, they're, I mean, obviously, China is a lot more <laughs> liberal and free in that respect compared to Japan. Um, but in a, in, a, in a global sense, <clears throat> you know, uh, can they do that? And another thing is Japan is because it was this, this is the problem and also the sort of the um, it's a problem and also it's it's a blessing for japan in the sense that the the growth period went through you know about 30 40 50 years of growth period and and actually the older population they, they have they have they have financial assets stock in in, in, a, in a macro sense because they, they built it up right um i would imagine in china <clears throat> in a lot of the emerging markets um that have experienced growth very very rapidly in a very short period of time the older generation that doesn't really have that <clears throat> um stock plus in many of the uh, countries they don't have the social welfare system to support it and so um th that's that's a, i think that's a big difference from japan and, and the china and other um emerging markets in terms of the even though they might have the same demographics <clears throat> is, is that, that that kind of profile is is totally different um but you know it's but it's obvious it's not like it's not like japan can stay says like oh are you with china or are you with the u.s you know, it's like, well, we're in the middle, <laughs> and obviously we have to work with both, both, both of these, uh, you know, giants. <clears throat> and Japan will never be China, never be the United States in in terms of in in terms of population, obviously, but in other characteristics. And so, you know, we, we don't have to be China or the United States, but there there must be some, you know, a good middle power, middle ground that can work with these sort of opposing. Uh, you know, powers is my, that, that's why it's made with. 
So, so we have we have two doubters uh, in the audience at least. Uh, just, like just, just, just two, uh, just two. I think I was thinking maybe about <laughs> half. <laughs> so, um, uh, so let, let's start with this. If you're talking demographics, still, David, um, who is in in Tokyo, uh, is not as convinced that the young Japanese, always the young Japanese that are doing something. Right? There was a Shinji Rui, the, you know, the young Japanese, but, 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 but his impression of the young Japanese is that they're not quite hungry enough, I guess, or maybe their progress on English language is not, I mean, the average, although I would, I would say to David, hmm, I think that the, the average Japanese uh, English capability is, is much higher than the average American's capability to do anything globally, but, but still, I, I, I get the point, right? So, so how significant is this non-hungry youth? for yeah. your for your framework yeah no i mean, I, I agree with david um because um you know the young generation the young generation that comes in front of me is they're so hungry and they're so excited and then they, 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 you know, they're 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 really on it right and it's like, like like when i was their age i was just drinking doing stuff in ucsd right it's like i mean <laughs> like, so it's really amazing it's just beyond my sort of comprehension and so there's these guys <clears throat> but david's points well how about these guys the mass and it's like yeah japan's very comfortable i mean i look at my kids they're comfortable they, they like their bukatsu you know um, you know <clears throat> and then so then that, that's why i said if 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 that switch comes on and if that switch doesn't come on um then we're headed to our foreseen future and, and I'm, think, I'm saying, my question is, standing here, well, do we just sit, stand around and say, oh, well, this is our future, this is our, for, this is our foreseen future, or, we, or do we try to give an, uh, instill an environment, <clears throat> give stimulus, something to you know, turn on that switch for the younger generation? And that's the responsibility for the, for the mass older generation. Not not to get in the way, actually, for the younger. So we guys, we had the uh, we had Jesper Call uh, on 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 the Jay Z you know a mm -hmm. while back, and he was asked about discrimination and women, and and he made a very interesting point, um, and that first of all that discrimination in Japan, of course, is the women thing and, and the womenomics and all that, but but in his view, the discrimination was really against the young. So if you look at a large Japanese corporation, they are not. The, the, the way he put it was, uh, imagine you're a 25 year old and you're very smart and you're, you know, you studied hard. So you, you can, you can work for, for Google or you can work for, um, you know, some Wall Street place, or you can work for, let's say, Kana. And so if you work for Google or the Wall Street place and, and you're really good in 10 years, you will be somebody, right? You will, you will have you know, responsibility, you'll run a division, you'll be something. At Canon, in 10 years, you'll be section chief, right? Or something like that. And so, uh, so, the, so the way to make the Japanese use hungrier, I think, would just be to break that open, as you already said earlier, right? So the, the stable mentality or the, the boot camp or the kawanmachi mentality probably has to give way. What do you see in terms of Japanese companies. So you're at Keizai Doyukai. What's this? A group of forward-looking Japanese companies. I mean, is that is that the topic, or would you like to see more there? What 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 are oh, what yeah. are the discussion topics? There? Um, that that is the topic. That is the topic, and but I'd like to see more. Um, in in the top management, they, they get it. They get it. <clears throat> you know, because uh, it's obvious. <laughs> they get it. Um, but what happens? I think what happens is happening in large Japanese corporations is a lot of the uh, hiring is done by the, the by the jinjibu the personnel department um you know and they're hardworking people obviously they're not, they're not evil or anything um but you know they're kind of still back in the show up period in terms of th their mode of, of hiring because they have to hire so many people so it's, it's more about uh, efficiency of hiring rather than finding that sort of gem right um and so and and obviously, you know, in Japan, the stigma about making mistakes about hiring that that that'd be like kind of a disaster, right? And so they kind of go to the for the to their comfort zone, and so I see a disconnect actually from what what we're discussing at the top management level, and and the hiring practices of large corporations. If the and if that hiring practices don't change dramatically, well, guess what? The school's not going to change because the exit 
for schools is the is that is that point right and and so and that's why the education system in japan um is still in the show period because the hiring practices of many of the japanese corporations still in that era so so uh so saori uh who's a, a political scientist in in los angeles um has a has a question about what your vision entails for the kaksa shakai that is to say the, the unequal society right so if you have the new mobility you have the new made with japan you have the top 10 percent talent that can go and there's meritocracy and, and and labor mobility and they can find the places that they want to be in and connect with the world what will that do to japan's domestic system uh, 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 and so uh, uh, domestically i guess is, is, is the question yeah um, well question. so so the key word is with right and so that means it's basically it has, you have to come and realize it's not just for the top one percent, two percent, three percent, four percent driving the whole you know system. It has to be with, it has to be inclusive. Um, and if you go back to my um, great great grandfather's philosophy, whatever you, you, you call longoto soroban, right? It's teachings of Confucius, morality, and um, soroban, which is the uh, the original hand and hill calculator. Let's yeah, call so it accounting. It's, it's business, right? And so, yeah, and, yeah. and so it's, it's the, I call it the power of and, to is and, and it's also with, right? And so, um, and, and to me, if you just rely on the government for uh, social equality, you know, that, that's a model that's been in place for a long time. <clears throat> and, you know, and, you know, it's necessary. Um, but my great great grandfather from 100 150 years ago was basically saying yeah there's a role for the government um, but there's also a role for the private sector to have inclusive you know to think about inclusive what, what's an inclusive society um, and what does that mean for the prosperity for for the entire uh, you know uh, nation and so um, you know there's still lots of lots of issues and you know and because Poverty here in Japan, it's sometimes not as visible, I think, if you walk around the streets, because people tend to be dressed sort of same, in a sense, but, you know, um, but, you know, there, there are instances where, you know, um, and actually during this Corona uh, last year and a half, uh, a young uh, friend of mine, he runs an NPO in, in the Kansai in Osaka um, for uh, these young kids that you know basically have nowhere to go basically so um um and and his work is the sort of the uh what do you call it the uh then so the people that call in and for help it just it's skyrocketed <clears throat> and so so obviously this you know this corona period has been very very uh, hard for especially uh for the people that have been left behind um and so but um but there are NPOs and the younger generation, this guy, you know, I mean, he, he could be successful in, in, on Wall Street or anywhere, but but his passion is to do this, right? And so and so there are these young generations um, that, that are passionate about it. And, and they're old, older fogies like me that think this is a great thing and that we should be supporting <clears throat> uh, things like that. So um, again, you know, on a, on a global scale compared to the other countries still, you know, yeah, okay, lots of issues, but, but, Compared to the past, I think I think that we're we're in definitely the right directions, and there are players that recognize <clears throat> that this is a problem. Not just not just leave it to the government, but you know take it into the private sector's uh, initiative as well. So uh, Yuriko is another one of the uh, negative voices. Uh, she, she wants to talk about Heisei, and uh, so I always you know I've, I've written about Heisei as a period of transformation rather than lost. It's not mm -hmm. not lost. Transformation is a is a positive thing. You're you're you know you're taking large companies that were built for the Shoba model of Japanese competitiveness, which is uh, made in Japan, and you turn them around and make them made by Japan, and you have this whole kudoka to deal with and so forth. And so there's a there's a whole transformation there. But she she said she always thought about Heisei as a period of decay, of 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 loss, of lost opportunity, of, of uh, failing, falling. Um, and you mentioned distraction. 
And so, uh, so, so what, what is Heisei really? How do we want to wrap our heads around the, these Heisei years in your, I mean, is there, can, can oh. you say anything positive about that? Or is it really just a, a bad time that she would? That, that well, she I, mean, would? I mean, loss is, a, loss is a big, big wake up call. If you don't lose anything, so I think, well, this is fine. Right. right. Whether it's whether it's your whether it's your financial assets or whether it's a family member you lose and you're kind of like, ooh, that that was bad. <clears throat> and so basically, yeah, loss. You need loss. That's a wake up call. And so, what's a transition? What's a transformation? It's a wake up call. And so, it took Japan thirty years to wake up. Well, okay, <laughs> you know, it took thirty years, but but doesn't mean we have to be you know asleep for the next thirty years. Yeah, I like that. So your classmate, I believe, Steve from UCLA says, Hey, I, Steve. <laughs> I'm wondering, he says, if yeah. you could elaborate a little bit more of what you mean with a mate with Japan. It's a nice label, but can you maybe give us an example of what exactly you have in mind when you say mate with Japan? Okay, well, Steve, uh, check out check out my uh, podcast with uh, Tomo Kumahira. Uh, and, and to me, he, I mean, I posed this question with him and he says like, well, I don't think about Japan is like, like, like you know, show your flag kind of Japan. But he says like, there's a social, there's a, there's a problem uh, in society that he wants to solve and he, and he wants to do it in Africa in, in forestry, uh, provide jobs for people in Africa. And then, and he doesn't think about being Japanese in doing that, but, but because he's <clears throat> Japanese, a lot of the solutions actually comes from Japan. And so, and I thought that was a beautiful way to sort of, uh, put a you know to put uh, what's the right word for in english i can't think of the right word now but you know i think that to me that's a that's a beautiful made with japan model you know it's not it's not this huge you know scalable <clears throat> kind of stuff but to me what's important is yeah scale scaling it is important but just having these lots of you know small cases scattered all around the globe of made with japan and and to me um you know, we live in a connected society. And so if there's a lot, a lot of things going on scattered, we're, we're all connected, so. Um, yeah, so in, in my book, I call that the sort of this this new little, the little dots, the aggregate niche strategy, uh, right? Uh, so uh, where uh, where uh, there are particular, there are, there are input parts and little sectors, they're not big, but in the aggregate, they add up where either one Japanese company has the dominant global market share or several Japanese companies combine to feed into the global supply chain. And so, for instance, a lot of people say that Japanese electronics is dead, uh, but the, the reality is that without Japanese companies, we cannot make, the world cannot make a single semiconductor or LCD panel. That the, because there are certain parts of that production process that are actually made maybe in Japan, maybe by Japan somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of this is in advanced materials and chemicals and. And, and sensors and that sort of thing. So um, uh, yeah, so so uh, 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 Nalin now brings up the obvious uh, question that I think you know a lot of people have been waiting for. Your great great grandfather was part in the Ministry of Finance at some point in the early Meiji period, right? And so let's go to government. Um, what is so <laughs> Shova? Eva, what is the role of government, bureaucrats, ministries in this whole new next 30 years? I mean, they clearly have to, if, if everything is changing, then do they also have to change? Will they be facilitators? Will they be in the way? Should, they, should we, should we uh, abolish METI or <laughs> uh, wash their heads as the Germans say, you know, kind of change them? Well, I think to me, I guess that people have different expectations what a role of government is. But for me, the role of government is for to provide infrastructure and services and other needs that cannot be provided just by the private sector and market me mechanism. That, that's like national security and things like that and, 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 and social security as well. But um, and um, so they have different roles, I think. But they have different roles, but the organizational mentality is the same. Meaning, it's still Showa, right? They they join a, they join a company or a bureaucracy. They're there for well, less for a bureaucrat, but still they're there. Um, and it's it's up until they're you know you know fifty or something, in their fifties. Um, so 
it, it, the, the organizational sort of ethos is the same. And so there's lots of silos. And silos is, is one barrier to this made with concept, obviously. <clears throat> um, MITI is actually probably the least silo of the bureaucracies in a sense, because they're all over the place. But but internally, they're pretty siloed, actually. <laughs> they're right. all, over, they're right. all over the map, but That's inside true. the university, they're, they're really siloed, you know? Yeah. And, and so, um, and then, then we can get into sort of talking about, well, well the role of the bureaucracy in, in, in politics. That's another, that's another uh, you know, in, in the past, there was just one, quote, ruling party, and then there's the bureaucracy that sort of fed all the, you know, the, the policy, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, solutions and things like that. Um, now it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit different, right? And because um, in the past, politicians didn't, because by, they didn't have to, maybe, they didn't really sort of meddle with sort of what the, what the bureaucracy organization was doing directly. But now, um, in the, and during the Heisei transition period, it says, no, no, the, you know, the, 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 the politicians, the we are the you know the voices of the public. We have to go have governance on, on the bureaucracy, and and that, that was good in a sense, it made sense. But at the same time, now everybody in the bureaucracy is looking is looking is looking at the you know the powerful <laughs> politicians, uh, you know, um, and sort of when that politician changes, then it kind of changes and stuff like that, and so uh, so. The role of government's very, very important, but maybe maybe they're still in the period of uh, uh, of transformation transition. Um, so so Christina and Jenny combine a, um, both have the same question basically, which is why do you think there's so much interest in your great great grandfather right now? Uh, do you think that the government and NHK planned the tiger drama? Uh, beyond the blue sky, uh, in an effort to inspire entrepreneurs and norms in Japan. I mean, is there is this is this a is this a scheme to get people excited about their you know it was possible then it's possible now or is this just happenstance yeah well, well the time well the well, <laughs> the interest in japan is obviously for for the mass population is because of, of the t tv drama series but the why did that happen is the question and well 2019 uh uh Finance Minister also made the announcement for the new new bills and he included uh Shibasawa Eichi. I asked the Ministry of Finance and how it was decided. I thought it was like some kind of committee or something like that. Um, he said, oh, oh the, the minister decided. So it's like, well, good good sense. <laughs> so it's got, but I'm sure he had choices and he said this, 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 and that kind of stuff. But um, but um, but it's, but I think the reason the reason the, the, the reason that Shibasawa H is coming back is a sense because because the we we are entering this new era and as I mentioned at the opening that um, Japan went through uh, a, a transition of era from the feudal state to the to the you know quote the modern state <clears throat> democratic state um, and and currently I think we're in this transition of the 20th century into the 21st century in 20th century we said well you know Milton Freeman all right okay you, okay you got it you know it says markets um, is everything. Um, the social uh, responsibility of corporations to make money. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> that, that kind of mentality. And now, you know, you know, people at Davos are saying stakeholder capitalism, business, business roundtable saying stakeholder capitalism, that kind of stuff. And so, um, and, and what's driving the difference, I think that the, the driving the, the sort of change in this sort of thinking is the technology because Anybody could be a broadcaster now, so 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 corporate managers have to not you know look at the you know shareholders, but they have to look at a lot of stakeholders. <clears throat> Final question. Okay. Uh, it's always Hugh Patrick's question from you know Professor Hugh Patrick from Columbia has asked me to to channel him and ask this question: What are you worried most about regarding Japan? What is your what is your biggest concern? Um, to quote my friend Christina Amazon, <clears throat> you're probably your friend as well, just staying in the comfort zone. Japan's comfortable. It's comfortable living here. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that's, that's the, the biggest the frog thing. In the, the frog in the warming water. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great. It's, 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 you know, life is good living here for most people because it's very, very comfortable. But, you know, so you need this sort of period of loss and things like that to figure out, oh, okay, <laughs> I get it. 
so. Yeah, and, and China will have something to do with that, right? Because that is a wake up call. Uh, you know, the, the, the loss of industries and copying, mass production. Yeah, and also like, like you know, what's happening in Hong Kong, you know, it says, well, okay, we'll go to Taiwan next. And it's like, well, ooh, that, that, that gets a little bit closer, right? For Japan um, in the US as well. And, and so, yeah. All right, unfortunately time is up. Uh, there are many more questions. I, I'll share those with you later. Uh, Ken Shibusawa, thank you very much for joining us right. today. Great. It was great. And everybody will see you next week with Asby Brown, who is an architect and artist. And he'll talk about what we can learn from Japan in terms of city planning, design and architecture uh, towards a more sustainable living. So uh, that sounds very interesting. It'll be great. See you next week until then. Uh, stay well, take good care, and uh, goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.